lovely to see you this morning. Welcome. Sun is shining. Yes. Praise the Lord. <laughs> Praise the Lord. Um, do, do, you, do you sometimes hear a bit of um, information or statistic that you kind of think, I did not know that? And it just kind of like grabs your attention. So, so here's a few. A cloud typically weighs a million tons. I didn't know that. That's really heavy, isn't it? Here's another one. Wearing a tie can reduce the blood to the brain by 7.5%. There's lots of reasons I don't wear a tie on a Sunday, but this is now added to them. A lightning bolt is five times hotter than the surface of the sun. I didn't know that. Here's another shocking statistic, but way more serious. Back in 2022, there was a survey conducted by the Money and Pension Service. And they looked at how many people in various communities around the UK, how many people needed regulated formal debt advice. And they measured that as people that were either behind in at least one priority bill, so something like your gas, electric, something like that, they were either in late stage creditor action, or in the past six months had experienced a court summons, bailiff action, eviction, or repossession. So this is fairly serious financial issues. The percentage of people that needed regulated, formal debt advice. I wonder what percentage is in your head. Well, here are the numbers. In Spelthorne Borough, so just down the road, Leafy Surrey. Click. In Spelthorne Borough, it's about 16%, one in six people. In Richmond Borough, it's 18.6%, about one in five people. And in Hounslow Borough, it's a little over 25%. In other words, one in four people in the borough that we're sat in right now need regulated formal debt advice. Shocked? I was shocked. Maybe you're one of those people, or you know one of those people. Our longing as human beings surely has to be that all of those people would be helped to become debt-free. If you've got a pulse, surely that has to be our longing. If you're a follower of Jesus, a Christian, our longing surely has to be that they would all experience the abundant freedom of life that Jesus comes to give us. And that would be true for all of us, but for these people as well. Surely, as followers of Jesus, that would have to be our longing. So this morning, we're kicking off a new series which we've entitled Radical Generosity, Abundant Freedom. And we're going to be thinking about how radical generosity can lead to a release of freedom in our world. If you have a Bible with you, could you turn to 2 Corinthians chapter 8? We're going to be talking about generosity this morning, and as we talk about generosity, we have to talk about money. And one of the realities is it is far easier to talk about sex in a church than it is about money. So pray for me, pray for us all. This is, this is kind of territory that none of us like going in, but we have to remember that 50% of Jesus' parables are about money. In Luke's gospel, one in seven verses are about money. It's everywhere in the teaching of Jesus. There is a fundamental connection between our generosity and our spiritual lives, how we handle money and how we're doing in a relationship with Jesus. So I'm going to read the first nine verses of 2 Corinthians chapter 8. This is the Apostle Paul writing. He says, And now, brothers and sisters, we want you to know about the grace that God has given the Macedonian churches. In the midst of a very severe trial, their overflowing joy and their extreme poverty whirled up in rich generosity. For I testify that they gave as much as they were able and even beyond their ability. Entirely on their own, they urgently pleaded with us for the privilege of sharing in this service to the Lord's people. And they went beyond our expectations, having given themselves first of all to the Lord, they gave themselves by the will of God also to us. So we urge Titus 
just as he had earlier made a beginning, to bring also to completion this act of grace on your part. But since you excel in everything, in faith, in speech, in knowledge, in complete earnestness, and in the love we have kindled in you, see that you also excel in this grace of giving. I'm not commanding you, but I want to test the sincerity of your love by comparing it with the earnestness of others. For you know the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, that though he was rich, yet for your sake he became poor, so that you, through his poverty, might become rich. Wonderful verses, aren't they? Wonderful verses. The background is this. There was a collection of money underway, and it seems to have been directed towards Christians in Jerusalem who were experiencing persecution. And the Corinthians had started a collection, but they'd not finished. And so the Apostle Paul is writing to them. And what he does is he points to this group of churches in Macedonia. And life for the Macedonian Christians was not easy. And you see that in verse 2. And I'm going to read that little bit of the text again, but in the message rendering of these verses. It it reads this way. Fierce troubles came down on the people of those churches, pushing them to the very limit. Some authors think they were experiencing famine. Life was really hard for these Macedonian Christians, pushing them to the very limit. But then Paul writes, the trial exposed their true colors. In other words, when that pressure came on, what was in their hearts came to the service. And he says this, they were incredibly happy. What? (laughs) You're experiencing all of this trouble, and yet you are incredibly happy, though desperately poor. The pressure triggered, triggered something totally unexpected. It kind of catches Paul off guard. An outpouring of pure and generous gifts. I was there and saw it for myself. They gave offerings of whatever they could, far more than they could afford. I love this pleading for the privilege of helping out in the relief of poor Christians. So they were poor, but they said, we have to do something. We have to do something. I, I read that. I, I love that rendering of that text. There's something in there that goes, wow. Don't you want to live a life like that? Even then, when trouble and trial comes on, we say, how can I help somebody else? What can I do? I love that. Three things. How can we live like that? Three things I want to share this morning. The first is this. To understand generosity, look at Jesus. Look at Jesus. Verse 9. He was rich, yet for our sakes became poor, so that we through his poverty might become rich. Through Scripture, you find a number of what I call great reversals. (laughs) And this is one of those great reversals. Um, He was rich yet became poor so that we who were poor could become rich. Jesus, who has everything, gave everything so that those of us who have nothing get everything. One of the great reversals of the gospel. Jesus gave up the riches of heaven so that people like us could receive the riches of heaven. Jesus gave up his freedom willingly on the cross, so that those held captive by sin and death can receive the freedom of God. Great reversals. He was rich, yet for our sakes became poor, so that we through his poverty might become rich. So you want to understand generosity? Look at Jesus. He gave everything. And if you hear today and you say, I'm a follower of Jesus. As I shared last week, a follower of Jesus, one primary part of that is that we're an imitator. We've said yes to imitating Jesus. And the way of Jesus is radical generosity. As I've been reading this text from 2 Corinthians chapter 8, it seems that one thing that Paul is trying to do is to work out how these Macedonians had given so generously. What was going on in their lives? And I love the way that he kind of summarizes it in verse 5. He says, they gave themselves first 
to the Lord. The message says unreservedly. They gave themselves unreservedly to the Lord and then to us. So what does it look like to be radically generous? Well, firstly, we give ourselves completely to the Lord. Completely to the Lord. So let me just make this practical. What does this mean in terms of the way that we handle money? What does it mean? Well, let me illustrate it this way. Here is 100 pounds, okay, in crisp banknotes. 100 pounds. This is approximately the daily pre tax pay for somebody on average earnings in the UK per day, is around about that. So when we think about giving, we can be tempted to think that this 100 pounds is mine. I earned it. Blood, sweat, and tears. It's mine. So how much of it shall I give? I don't think that's the way that the Bible invites us to think about money and giving. A follower of Jesus, I believe, understands that this all belongs to God. All belongs to God. I grew up in the Anglican church. Part of our liturgy at the offering went like this. All things come from you, O Lord, and of your own have we given you. All things come from you, O Lord. So it is all God's. So I think the right way to think about our money is when the offering basket comes around, it is all God's. All belongs to him. It's all his. We give ourselves unreservedly to the Lord. In other words, we say, I'm all in. It, it's all his. And then very graciously, the Lord says, Andy, you're going to need some food and some clothes. So why don't you take, if you're tithing, you take 90 pounds out to live on. And that's the gracious gift of the Lord, because we're all in. As we've shared, um, you know, just in, in this church for myself and Beth, and we've chosen to go above and beyond that, so we leave 20 in. And that's the way that we've chosen to live our lives. See, giving is a test of our hearts. It tests, am I all in? Am I acknowledging that all of this belongs to the Lord? And so it seems to me that if we want to know how we're doing, one of the first places we need to look is our giving to the church that we're a part of. It's one of the first places to look. We give ourselves completely to the Lord, and then we give ourselves to the Lord's work. We give ourselves to one another and what we do together. It seems to me that it is an incredible privilege to give generously to the church that we're a part of. And so if you're giving to our church here at Riverside Vineyard, we give to children's ministry, youth ministry, additional needs ministry, young adults, bereavement support, small groups, busy bees, parents and toddlers group, alpha, prisons ministry, theology and leadership training, worship and prayer, world missions, church planting, evangelism, a food bank, a money advice center, a job club, a mental health cafe, English language classes, and loads more. Our giving keeps the lights on. If you had a coffee this morning, it didn't come from the coffee fairies. It's our giving that brews the coffee. It seems to me that as we give, it is amazing what we get to do together. And so it is a really good discipleship habit to prayerfully review our giving at least once a year. If you're here and you're just visiting us today, delighted that you're here, this is sort of like some family business, so just bear with us. Um, but if this is helpful to you, if you're part of another church or you're just exploring what life with Jesus looks like, I hope that what I share is helpful. But one of the things that we do each year is invite everyone that's part of this church to review our regular giving, and we are inviting you to do that this month, to look at what we get and what we regularly give from that. And for some, as um, we share about this, this is the time to start giving. Maybe you've never given before, 
And this is the sort of the catalyst to say, you know what, I'm going to start doing that. Or maybe you do give sporadically, now's the time to give regularly. Or maybe you're someone who gives regularly, now's the time to consider tithing, or to tithe, or to go beyond a tithe and to give more. We're also heading towards a gift day on the 19th of May, in just two weeks' time. And I want to just share a little bit about that this morning. I shared that statistic at the start of my talk, that 25% of people in Hounslow Borough need regulated debt advice. I heard that number about, I don't know, a month or so ago. I'm still reeling from that. It seems an extraordinarily high number to me. Now, if you've been around our church community, you'll know that over the past two to three years, Kim Hurst and a team that she leads have set up a money advice center. And we've done that in partnership with CMA, Community Money Advice. And what that does is it provides more support for those people who need help navigating their finances. The reality is that the vast majority of families that connect with our Compassion Center, so things like food storehouse, clothes storehouse, those kind of things, the vast majority of those families need help navigating their finances. If people had the money that they needed, they would not need to access a food bank. And so there are around about 80 families a week that are accessing storehouse. The majority of those need more support navigating their finances. And so as a bunch of us have been thinking and praying and seeking the Lord, we sense that this is a moment to expand what we are able to do. This is a moment to substantially expand how we can support clients navigating their finances and particularly debt issues. We uh, bumped into somebody just a couple of weeks ago who came towards us um, and said, you know, there was all sorts of very difficult things going on in their lives, including they were £50,000 in debt. Like, how do you start to move out of that? How do you start to... Because the reality is, debt has a very real impact on people's lives. Many of you will have met Hannah Periton. Hannah is now our Compassion Center lead. And I asked her, like, could you just help me? Like, what does debt mean for people? Like, how does it impact lives? And she, she came back with this. People in debt are more than three times as likely as other people to attempt suicide. Three times more likely. Debt is a loss of freedom. For many, it is an entrapping cycle of shame embarrassment, stress, and borrowing. Of those experiencing debt-related stress, 86% believe it's hurting their relationships. I'm not sure the other 14% were honest. In fact, 72% of respondents say they're somewhat or very likely to go further into debt when they're feeling stressed. Can you see the spiral? found that 85% of people in debt said that being in debt had impacted their mental health, causing stress, anxiety, or depression. It's a serious issue. So we've been just thinking, like, what could we do? And as I say, we feel this is a moment to expand what we're able to do in terms of supporting people through their financial challenges. And the next step for us as a church community, as a compassion center, is to employ a part-time money advice center manager. They would serve clients both here at the Feltham site but also the food bank clients that we're connecting with at the Stain side. I've just had a yes from the Runnymede Food Bank trustees that we can partner in that way with them, which is wonderful. And so that, that money centre manager would also explore the possibility of us here at Riverside Vineyard becoming a regulated debt advice centre. We're just exploring different options in that space. The reality is right now we're not able to take this step as part of our regular budgets, but we feel the urgent need to act. And so we're inviting everyone that's a part of our church community here to consider making a gift 
over and above any regular giving to make this possible for an initial two-year period. And so that's what we're inviting our church community towards. And so to help us in this journey over the next couple of weeks, we've written a, a short brochure to help us to think about this and to pray through this ahead of the gift day on the 19th of May. The brochure looks like this. If you're in a small group or on a team, there is an envelope with your name on it at the back which we would love you to pick up this morning. One of the reasons we would love you to pick this up is one, you get this early, and secondly, there are now about 500 families who are in small groups or teams in the life of our church. 500 stamps costs a lot of money. As many of you know, we would love to save stamps. So please do grab a letter this morning. If you're in a small group or a team and there's not an envelope in your, with your name on it, apologies. That probably means the leader of your group or team is a little behind in updating the records, so have a chat with them. If you're not currently in a small group or on a team, firstly, we'd love to help you to find a small group or a team. It's the way that this church is going to work best for you. But there is also a whole basket full of blank envelopes at the back. We would love you just to grab one of those. All of the details are also online. For, so for those of you that are uh, joining us online today, or for any of us, we can simply jump on to riversidevineyard.com forward slash gift day, and all of the information is there as well. Bottom line, we would love every one of you to have a letter by the end of this morning. So do please grab one of these. Five things that we would love you to do over the next couple of weeks. Firstly, could you pray about how you can live a more radically generous life? R read again those words from 2 Corinthians chapter 8. Read Paul's exhortation, his, his, just the, his glowing praise for those Macedonian Christians, how they said, I need to help. I need to do something. See the way that they were happy about it. Read those words again. Firstly, pray. Secondly, would you pray about your regular giving to Riverside Vineyard Church for this coming year? Ask the Lord. My experience is this. When we ask the Lord, how much should I give? He always answers. He always answers. And then would you trust him by doing what he's inviting you to do? Remember how the Macedonians gave. It seems to me, and we're, we'll, I think this is a place we'll go to when we, when we come on to our ministry time, they were not stuck financially. They'd not got themselves kind of in a difficult pickle when it came to their money. Rather, what their lives exhibited was rich generosity. Even though they didn't have much, there was rich generosity generosity. They gave as much as they were able and even beyond their ability. They hadn't got themselves stuck. It seems to me that many of us get ourselves stuck financially. We kind of think, this is mine, and we hold on to it. The Lord invites us to come to him with open hands so that he can give us things into our hands and we can practice radical generosity. But it comes to how, whether, we, if, whether we've got ourselves stuck or unstuck in relation to money. And I want to invite you to pray, Lord, would you help me to live a life that is unstuck financially? Would you help me? Third thing, would you ask the Lord about how you could give or how you could pledge to give over the next 12 months over and above your regular giving to the development of our Compassion Center ministry through an expanded money advice center. We really want to help those people that are experiencing financial issues and debt issues to become free. Fourth thing, there is within this brochure a very short response card. We'd love you to bring that along to a service on the 19th of May. If you're away that day, Simply send it to the church office, or there is an online response card on the gift day page. If you want to make use of that, then feel free. And the fifth thing, 
Could you consider getting involved as a money coach, that's somebody who helps people with like their day-to-day -day budgeting, getting a budget in place, or as a money mentor, helping people through more debt advice kind of journeys, or as a befriender, the reality is, you've heard the stats, people facing these issues actually need somebody who will put an arm around them and walk with them. Could you maybe do that? As we expand our Money Advice Center, we're going to need to significantly expand the team of people that will help walk with people through this journey. And again, there is a space on the response card to say, yeah, I'd, I'd love to explore that. I'd love to consider that. And so if that's you, would you do that? So I hope that makes sense. I hope that's clear. Do grab one of these brochures, take that away, read it, have a pray, and then together, I think we can do amazing things together. I think we can do amazing things. I want to close with this verse. It just caught my attention a couple of months ago. It's from the book of 1 Samuel, second chapter, verse 8. The story you may well be familiar with, a lady called Hannah, she couldn't have children. God miraculously um, enables her to have a child. She has a baby, Samuel. She then after the birth of Samuel, prays out this amazing prayer of, of worship and, and thanks to God. And within it is this verse. He, the Lord, raises the poor from the dust and lifts the needy from the ash heap. He sets them with princes and makes them inherit a throne of honor. And I love that. Isn't that what we want for that 25.8% people in, in Hounslow Borough that are in need of regulated debt advice? Because I love the generosity here. It's not like these people are in the dust and the Lord just picks them up, dusts them down, and they stay where they are. He raises them as princes. That is utterly extraordinary, isn't it? The, the way that life is turned around. It seems to me that this is the kind of abundant life that Jesus talks about in John chapter 10, verse 10. I have come that you might have life and life it's all full, in all its fullness. So to people that find themselves like face down in the gutter, what the Lord is wanting to do through people like you and I is to lift them up. But not just to an ordinary place, but to a place of like royalty. That's what the life of Jesus does. That's what the freedom of Jesus does. And it seems to me that one of the ways that that freedom is released is through the radical generosity of God's people. That's what we long to see. Amen.